Well, on our anniversary Sunday, we're also closing out our series of walking through the Old Testament. And, uh, in the sermon part of it, you still have some devotional readings to, uh, ahead of you. But I hope you've been keeping up with those. And I hope that the, the Old Testament through this has just opened up a little more maybe than it was open before so that the whole counsel of God's Word is available to you. And uh, God, God has so many good things tucked away in that Old Testament. Sometimes we pass over it, and there's, there's some treasures to be found. Uh, and uh, thank you for wearing your, your colors today. Whoever, those of you who you had your favorite team and you put on your favorite thing, I, Hardin Simmons, I, even though it is where the dew falls first from heaven, I uh, don't have a shirt. And uh, Southwestern Seminary, the... I don't know, fighting hermeneutical expositors or whatever our <laughs> mascot was there at, at uh, Southwestern. I, I don't know that uh, I have much to work with there either, so uh, on we go. Okay, so I was reading that uh, about, did some looking up, about there are about 2,000 heart transplants in the United States each year. A little higher, a little lower. But we run about 2,000 heart transplants a year. And I got on a couple of sites where it was survivor stories, people who had, had been down that road through that journey. It's fascinating to hear the stories and moving. And each person had a story where life was just rocking along and everything's good, everything up and, up and to the right kind of a story. And then they began having problems. And maybe it was because of a heart defect that finally uh, presented itself. Maybe it was because of heart disease. Sometimes because a virus attacked the heart and everything just, just went bad. Uh, it, it was people who were old and people who were young. But in each case, there came a day when they walked in and sat down in the doctor's office and the doctor said, we've done all we can do. And you have about a year unless we can get you on the donor list and we can find someone who will donate a heart. That's a frightening prospect to be confronted with your own mortality, and there comes a day when everyone is going to face the end of life if Jesus doesn't come back in our lifetimes. And for these folks, they couldn't speed the process, control the process. It was out completely of their hands. All they could do was just to, if they got on the list, just to wait for a phone call that might or might not come in time. In each case, the person's own heart, in spite of great effort, could not be repaired, and the only hope they had was to have a heart given to them. Now, you have to consider that. For a heart transplant, there has to be a donor, and that donor, something has happened to them. They're brain dead, but still on life support, so the heart can, and sometimes other vital organs that can be donated, can be preserved and not only do you have to find the, find the donor, but you have to reckon with the challenge and the, the hurt that comes with it that for a person to live with a donated heart, somebody else is going to have to die. Now, the need is far beyond the availability, obviously, the willingness uh, of donors, because the person needing the transplant, they not only need a donor, but they need a donor that's compatible with them uh, and they also need, uh, need to know that there's going to be challenges because of you know, taking the rejection drugs and making sure that the body doesn't reject the donated organ so that they can keep the new heart strong. But one common thread that was found in the testimonials of heart transplant recipients is they were just overwhelmingly grateful to the individual, to the family that that was willing to donate because they knew, I've been given the gift of life. Now, the Bible has just a whole lot to say about the heart, and that's true in the Old and the New Testament. Uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, in the Bible, ancient peoples, primitive peoples, we would say in so many ways, they recognize the heart is, is the source of life. And in their writing, Old Testament, New Testament, they move way beyond just this thing in here pumping blood through our body. They move to the heart as the center of who we are, the source of life. 
It's where our desires, our passions, our thought, our understanding. It's where we deliberate, decide, desire. All those things are wrapped up in how the Bible talks about the heart. And the Bible says we have heart problems in that part of the heart of us. And, and it speaks to it in really powerful ways. Not the thing pumping blood, but the heart that is the core of, the core of who we are your identity and how you live, what you do about who you are, who you say you are. Our heart problem is sin, and really it's more deadly than any physical heart disease could be. And here's, here's why. It attacks our lives like a deadly virus. It, it wrecks life, it wrecks family, it wrecks culture, society. It hurts the people around us too, because think about when it's our, that, that, biblical heart part of us it is so deadly contagious to people around us it filters out the decisions that we make that are contrary to god's will how it how it impacts our kids and our grandkids and our friends and our people we work with in in such adverse ways it hurts the people around us infects because it is so deadly contagious and we need a cure for our heart trouble and the bible is a book that tells of the only cure. We're just going to have to have a new heart. Not a ref refurbished heart. Not a clean me, clean me up and try harder kind of heart. Because we can't fix this ourselves. We can't buy our way out. But the good news is a cure is available. And it comes to us as the gift of God. And only the gift of God. What does it mean to have a new heart? And today, as we've continued our journey through the Old Testament... Last week we talked about the, the prophets and the role the prophets had in the Old Testament. And today we're going to look at Ezekiel, another one of those prophets, at a, at a really pivotal time in the, the history of his people. And he gives some beautiful descriptions about a new heart way back then. So we're going to start out in Ezekiel chapter 11. Everybody find Ezekiel okay? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, you outrun your coverage if you uh, get to Daniel. So here we go. Ezekiel. It's a big old book. It ought to, ought to be fairly easy to find. It says, uh, verse 16, Therefore say, this is what the Lord says. That's a great way to, a great way to phrase things in the Bible. Uh, Therefore say, this is what the Lord says. There's authority when God says it. Though I sent them far away, He's talking about his people, the people of Israel. So I sent them far away among the nations, scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Their pieces of the exile have already taken place. Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says. I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you from the countries where you've been scattered, and I'll give you the land of Israel. When you arrive there, they will remove, when they arrive there, they'll remove all of its abhorrent acts and detestable practices from it. I'll give them integrity of heart and put a new spirit within them and will remove their heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh so that they'll be able to follow my statutes, keep my ordinances, practice them. They'll be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts pursue their desire for abhorrent acts and detestable practices, I'll bring their conduct down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord. Now, Ezekiel was living in troubled times, and this part of the book, it straddles, it straddles the central event, uh, his book, the, the central event in really the Old Testament, for Old Testament studies, and it is the fall of Jerusalem, destruction of the temple, the exile to, to uh Babylon only left, as we said last week, the poorest of the poor. And during his ministry, here's what Ezekiel's dealing with. Uh, he's a priest from a priestly family. He's on the inside of so much of what's happening in Jerusalem, among his people. And he lived during a time when he saw the religious reforms, an incredible revival under King Josiah. He's one of, we said there are about eight good kings in the southern kingdom wrapped around mostly Jerusalem, and Josiah is one of those guys. He is a good king because he loves God, and he doesn't just love God here, but he's going to use his influence to encourage his nation 
to love the Lord and to put away false teaching and to put away idolatry and, and, and the destructive habits that have led to so much brokenness among God's people. In the, we, we, we talked last week about the divided heart, and it was a divided heart kingdom, a whole set of people who just couldn't keep their focus on the Lord. Well, he, he went through the revival under Josiah, but then he went through a series of kings that just had, had no place in their heart for God, who, who were so evil and so twisted up, so far from God, and let everyone else to be far from God. He saw his nation devastated, the faith of his fathers deserted, and he saw his people just suffering the consequences of their sin, and not like it should have surprised him. Because remember, the covenant that we've talked about through our Old Testament journey has been really simple. Obey and be blessed, disobey and be cursed. And it shows up over and over and over again. In, in my personal Bible reading, I read Deuteronomy this last week. And in Deuteronomy, that message, Moses, he's about to die. They're about to enter the promised land when you get to Deuteronomy. We get a repeat on the law in Deuteronomy. And over and over, Moses just says, do what God said, it's going to go okay. You don't do what God said, it's not going to go well. In fact, it's going to go badly for you. And God, God's not really complicated about how he does things. Uh, there's not a great nuance to this. It's quite clear in the word of God. You do what God says, and, it, and it, that's how life works. You don't do what God says, it's not going to work. Ezekiel knows this, but his people seem to still be confused by it. So Ezekiel, by the time we get to chapter 11, Ezekiel is in Babylon. He was a part of the first group of people because he's part of the educated, kind of influential class in, in Israel. And though, that's the first group of people. The Babylonians came in. They said, okay, you guys are a bunch of nuts here. You're a mess. We're po more powerful than you. And the Babylonians came in. They took over. And they took people like Ezekiel and Daniel, who would have been hauled off at the same time they get hauled off in one of the early we're taking you to Babylon but at this point the walls are still around Jerusalem the gates haven't been burned and the temple's still standing and so it, it's a pivot point it could go any way and Ezekiel is calling back to Jerusalem from his exile in Babylon to say you guys still could get this right don't, don't continue down this path of destruction Ezekiel's people stubbornly resisted God in spite of their circumstances, though. See, here's the thing. They kept thinking, well, back in Isaiah's day when the Assyrians were surrounding Jerusalem and we were kind of under their influence so strongly, God bailed us out then because, you know, we're his people. So surely he'll do it again. So why don't we just wait until God zaps the Babylonians uh, all to pieces on our behalf and everything's going to be great. But they didn't want to change their hearts. They wanted to continue down a path that we're going to do what we want to do, live the way we want to live, but we're going to expect that God is going to fix everything for us, even if we are outright sinful, outright disobedient. And that's, uh, that's not that uncommon a pattern. We, we've all known people. I'm sure none of you, none of you have ever done this. But we know, we know people. I'm letting you way off the hook on this one. We know people the church down the street or wherever. And what they say is, I don't know where God is. Why are bad things happening to me? Uh, I mean, God ought to be taking care of me. I'm having this problem, that problem, that problem. But they don't look to the Lord. They don't follow the Lord. They don't obey the Lord. And yet they're expecting blessing. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. God's made it all clear in how this whole relationship to him works in the Old Testament for sure. Oh, there's still grace, and there's still mercy, and yet, expecting God to do everything they wanted to do without them doing anything God says to do. There is no repentance of sin among these people. So Ezekiel has this vision from the Lord, and in his vision, he sees judgment coming. But he also sees grace at work, and it's coming in the future that God will restore his people. He'll bring them back to the land, and they'll put away these sinful practices, and they're finally one day going to get it right, and... The gift of God promised in verse 19, and that's our focal verse for this, uh, is a gift of a new heart. Now think about this. A new heart is a gift from God, and that's what he offers to any of us today.
today, most clearly, surely, completely, fully, full, uh, accomplished, fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Just as, think about the back to our first illustration, just as, just as, the person donating a heart to a transplant recipient means they give up their life. Jesus gave up his life at the cross to pay for our sin. Just as a person needing a transplant in order to live has no other remedy without Christ, there is no other way to be saved. There's no other name, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We call this the exclusivity of Christ. And in a, in a pluralistic world, that's a hard pill to swallow for some folks that there's only one way to be saved. But there's only one way. Because God's truth is narrow and clear and precise. It's not whatever the world decides it should be. There's one way to be saved, and it's through Jesus Christ. But then there's the, that's the exclusivity. Then there's the inclusivity. Whosoever will may come. The, the gate is wide open. So what Jesus did at the cross accomplished the work that needs to be accomplished for all to be saved. Now, two things. What are the characteristics of a new heart offered to us by the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing, we spent all last week talking about this, and in your, in your groups you've been talking about the divided heart, that, that there's, just, uh, there's, a, there, there's a wrestling match taking place in our lives. Well, the new heart, it is undivided. In our verse, God promises to give one heart. But he's not talking about one heart like, hey, we're all in it together. We're on the same team. It's not unity of people. It's unity of the person. It's, it's about my heart no longer being divided, but unified around my Savior. Unity of the person. God has created each of us. You know, the Bible talks about it in Romans. We have a conscience. We know right. We know wrong. And, and the Bible says we have all chosen to sin, chosen to sin and we have done wrong. And we continue to do that. And there's this wrestling match over this. In Romans 7, Paul talks about it in his own heart. He says, I know what I ought to do, and I don't do it. Uh, th there are things that I shouldn't do that I do anyway. I have a constant tension, a constant tug of war in my heart because my heart is still divided, even for a believer. And even believers in Christ struggle with a divided heart. But without Christ, you're always going to lose that battle. You're going, to, you're going to lose it almost every time. Uh, we're, we're going to be inclined. The inclination of our heart is towards sin. And without Christ, we are without help and hope. Believers, uh, believers who uh, James writes to in his uh, little letter toward the back of your Bible, he says that there are people who, even, even when they're granted the new heart, they still lean into the divided heart way of life, like the surf of the sea, James writes, driven and tossed by the wind, double-minded, unstable in all his ways. To the command of the Lord in both Old and New Testaments, love the Lord your God with all your heart. To have a heart like Christ, completely devoted. Jesus showed us what it looks like to have the undivided heart. Through faith in Christ, your heart can be a unified heart, a focused heart instead of a divided heart. The second thing is that the new heart is softened. I've been talking to you for a long time uh, over the years about a lot of stuff, and, and there's things I disclose about myself along the way. But there are many things after these uh, couple of decades and a little more that I have not told you about me. One of those things is I'm a pretty awesome sculptor, and I don't know if all of you are aware of that, but... I'm pretty good. It started early in my life. And, and some of my earliest experiences actually in group sculpture activities at church. So we had these little cans of Play-Doh. We would take our can of play That's kind of hurtful. We <laughs> take our can of Play-Doh, and I could create some pretty amazing things out of a can of Play-Doh. And you know how that goes, but and one time, I remember one time specifically, there was this, I really went all in on a dinosaur that was really impressive. And the, all the other kids in Sunday school were kind of overwhelmed by that. They're still trying to figure out where it was in the Bible, some of those kids, but uh, it was a Bible story, and there's some verses that I, I would point to. But got my dinosaur, and I loved it. 
But you know, the, the sad part about Plato is always you, you create your, your, your marvel of artistic art, artistry, and then you have to smash it up, stick it back in the, in the can, put the lid on it. Well, I sat on my dinosaur. I was leaning out. You know what happened to my dinosaur? A day later, it was concrete. You know what Plato does? And, uh, I look at the Plato and I think, oh man, that's a, that is not going to ever be anything again. It's just a hard heart. Well, same thing happens with our hearts. It can happen rapidly with a lot of hearts. You just get hard to the things of God over time. And you're no longer moldable and easily. It doesn't make any difference how long you've been following the Lord. There's never a time when you say, this is the way it should be. This is the way it's going to be from now on. And I'm just going to run with this from here to there. Because God's always wanting to do something else in your life. Everybody, everybody here today has a next step with God. If you're all settled and satisfied that this is as far as I go and no more, that's, that's the hard heart. And you may know Jesus, but you just settled in on something that is way, behind, way below God's will for your life and his desire to continue to grow you in Christ. And what happens when you give your life to Christ? Not only do you have an undivided heart, but you've you got a soft heart. A heart that's still moldable, where you're still growing, still learning, still taking, ever taking a next step, and it's always before you with the Lord. That's an incredible gift of a new heart. Now, I got a question for you, those of you who are more in my age group. How many of you, you taught your children how to drive? How many of you went through that harrowing experience? Last week, we talked about uh, gray hair is just kind of our outline for the message. Uh, and uh, most of this came not from work, not from kids in school. It came from sitting in a car with them. And the, the, the frightening experience of, of, of sitting in the driver's side, and uh, as, a, as a mom told me after the first hour, her daughter said to her, first time she sat behind the wheel, isn't it great that you can sit, finally, you can sit on the passenger side and just relax instead of having to, oh my goodness, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the biggest steps of faith you ever take as a parent. And uh, there's a mom, got her, her daughter said, oh, I have my learner's permit, can I please drive the car to the store? And so mom, oh, okay, you know, they practice a little bit and, you know, the a parking lot or somewhere you know, fairly neutral, but now it's going to the store. And, okay, it's in the driveway, and uh, Mom says, now listen, remember what you're supposed to do. Let's get in the car. She gets in the car. Seat belt. Turns the car on. Moves her foot to the brake. Her uh, mom says, now remember, you're going to check, check your mirrors. So she checks. She adjusts appropriately her rearview mirror. She looks at her side mirror. She needs to do a little adjustment over here. And then she said, okay, is everything good? And the daughter said, yeah, I look great. <laughs> so here's the deal. Sometimes we just miss the point of this whole thing of what's really important. It's not about me trying harder. It's not about and goodness, we, we, we get this all the way through. You get it from uh, beginning to end. Jeremiah talks about it in great ways. Hey, how about this? How about I take out this heart of stone? Like the, the law was written on tablets of stone. Instead of writing on tablets of stone, why don't we write it on your heart? Why don't we just get it right down to you? I'm going to give you a soft heart, an undivided heart, and it's a gift from God. And here's the part I want you to get as we move forward in this day, is it's a gift God wants to give you today. Today. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The old has passed away. See that the new has come. And Chad, Chad talked about a new heart. And you notice he didn't say an improved. Uh, he didn't say better, fixed up repaired or refurbished because those words imply that that there's still some of the old in there but we've tried to make it better no new means nothing in there is from the old it's all new 
It's brand new. It's different. And that's what Paul said to the people in Corinth. He says, the old is gone. And what's the old that he's talking about? Well, you, you have to look just a couple of verses earlier. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 says, And he, talking about Jesus, died for all so that those who, should, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. The old heart, the old way of life is totally focused on pleasing self. If you've been with us the, these last uh, six weeks as, as we've been looking through the Old Testament and following God's people and their story, um, you know that, that one of the things that characterizes the, the people of God uh, and more often than not is they ignored God and they did whatever they wanted to do. They were, they were definitely a selfish people. And unfortunately, that's still true today. We are selfish. I'm, I'm a selfish person. And it's not just... It's not just this generation, it's, it's every generation. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we're all guilty of turning our backs on God and choosing to do our own thing. And when we do that, that's called sin. And sin is an act of rebellion against God. Any sin, all sin, it's all rebellion. And we, uh, we, we tend to try to categorize sin, but... Here's the deal. It's all evil in the sight of a holy and perfect God. Our sin, it separates us from God. It severs the relationship that we were supposed to have with him. And I want you to hear this. A perfect God can have no fellowship or community with sin. It's, sin is not his nature. Sin is not tolerated by God. Sin is a very, very, very big deal. And, and in case you haven't picked up on this yet, we're, we're all sinners. Uh, I, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're, we're all separated from God, and we're all incapable of that fellowship and community with God. And, and you say, well, well, why is that? Because we choose, we choose, and we've chosen, and maybe even today in some area of your life, you choose yourself over God. We choose to trust ourselves over God. We choose to listen to anything and everything, and we let those Anything and everything drown out the voice of God in our lives. We think that we know better than God. That's, that's why that relationship is severed. That's why we have no fellowship because of sin. And we have to fix this problem. Otherwise, we are sentenc we're sentencing ourselves to a life, this life, without true peace, without true joy, without true satisfaction. And we're also sentencing ourselves to an eternity separated from God. So, so what do we do? And that's, that's the million-dollar question. What do we do? How do we fix this problem? And that brings up another problem, and that's this. There's absolutely nothing we can do. Zero. Zilch. And if you're bilingual like me, nada. That means nothing. We can't do anything to fix it. You're saying, wait a minute, Jimmy, I have a problem. It's a huge problem, and I have to get it fixed, but there's nothing that I can do to fix it. Yep, that's exactly what you're telling, I'm telling you. And people have tried to fix it on their own, and people continue to try to fix this problem on their own. They try to fix it by, well, I'm, I'm going to be nice, or I'm going to live a good life. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to give a lot of money to the poor. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going I'm, I'm to go to church. I, I'm going to be a good husband or a good wife. I'm going to be a good, uh, a good uh, father or mother. I'm going to be a good son or daughter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard. I'm going to make lots of money, and, and I'm going to be real generous with that. I'm going to help uh, old ladies across the street. I'm, I'm going to be highly educated. I'm going to make good grades. I'm going to try religious type things. Uh, I'm going to medicate this. You know, maybe if I can get drunk enough or high enough, I can distract myself that maybe that this problem will go away. But none of those work. Because all of those are us trying to fix a problem that we can't fix. So what's the solution? Well, Chad told you the solution. The solution is a new heart. And how do you get that new heart? Here's how you get it. By surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Jesus, God's only son, God in the flesh, came down to this earth and he lived a sinless life. And, and don't skip over that detail. It was a sinless life. If you, if you know anything about the Old Testament and, and people coming to worship God, they often brought, almost always brought a sacrifice. And the sacrifice had to be of an animal that was unblemished. That it, 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 it had to be perfect. It had to be the, the, the best of the best. 
in order to satisfy a holy God. And, and here's what I want you to know. You and I, we're not unblemished. <laughs> we're not perfect. We, we are sinful. But Jesus met that criteria. He was the sinless son of God, and he died uh, on a cross for our sins. He was that perfect sacrifice, which, by the way, is, is, the, is the penalty for sin. Sin costs death. It costs not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. That's that whole eternity separated from God thing. But God, he knew the, he's knowing the cost of our sin. He knew what it was going to cost us. And knowing that he didn't want us to have to suffer that cost, he sent his son to pay the price. And not just pay part of the cost, but to pay all of it. You see, Jesus on the cross took the full wrath of God towards sin. Everything that, that, that needed to happen to us as sinners happened to Christ. Remember, Chad said, in order for someone to receive a heart transplant, that meant someone was going to have to die. Christ had to die so that you and I, we could have life. We could have new life. We could have a new heart. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Our sins have been forgiven. We, we can have that new start. There are still consequences that we have to deal with with our sin, but when you surrender your life to Christ, you go from a sinner who's been given a spiritual death sentence to a person who's been given new life. And this is what God does. God d did this. Not because you and I, because we earned it, or not because you and I, we deserved it, but simply because God loved us. By sending Jesus to die on the cross, he showed us grace. He gave us something that we didn't deserve. And he showed us mercy by not giving us exactly what we deserve. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's God's gift. It's his gift, not from work so that no one can boast. And I said there was nothing you can do to fix your problem. Jesus provided the way through his death and resurrection. He gave us the new heart. There's nothing that we, we didn't have anything to do with that. But there is one thing that we have to do in order to receive this new life, that new heart. And that's this, to say yes to Jesus. To say yes to him. Ha saying yes to him to, to be your salvation, to, to save you from your sins, to rescue from sin, to offer that forgiveness. And saying yes to him, to letting him be Lord of your life. Think about king. God, Jesus is the ultimate king, and, and we are letting him to be boss of our lives. We're saying yes to Jesus' agenda for our life, to his priorities for our lives, to, for, for how he wants us to love other people, for how he wants us to use our time, our talents, our treasures. We're saying yes to Jesus, yes to, the, to this new life. And the Bible says that when you say yes to him, when you believe that, that you are a sinner and there's nothing you can do about that, when you believe that Jesus came into this earth, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, a, a horrible death for our sins, took that complete wrath of God, and then three days later, he defeated sin, death, and the grave, and he gave us new life in Christ. And that right there was that made it possible for us to be restored in relationship. When you believe that in your heart, and you call out to God and say, God, I want you to save me, the Bible says that you are saved, period. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. And that new heart is available to everyone, right? Chad said the exclusivity of Christ. Jesus Christ provided the only way, but the inclusivity of Christ is for God so loved the world that he wants everyone to be saved. And so if you would like to say yes to Jesus, this, this is your opportunity today, right now, to say yes to him. And just a little bit, as a church family, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're, we're going to enter in a time of worship. And there's going to be a lot of people walking forward to come to get the elements, people come walking forward maybe to pray. Uh, but if you want to give your life to Christ, you want to talk to someone, I, I, I encourage you as people start moving forward that you, you come walk up to me, you walk up to our pastor, walk up to our church leaders that are going to be up here, and you look at them and you simply say this, I want to say yes to Jesus today. And we'll pray with you and we'll walk you through that decision and, and, and get you on the road to being a follower of Christ. But in just a moment, as people start moving, you move forward too. And you come and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. This morning, we're going to close our time together in worship by sharing in the Lord's Supper.
Um, Chad mentioned this, Jeremiah 31, 31 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. And then you fast forward into Luke, the Gospel of Luke 22, 19 and 20. And this is talking about Jesus. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jeremiah prophesied about the new covenant that God would be establishing with his people. And Jesus, hundreds of years later, is the ultimate fulfillment of that new covenant. The, co- the new covenant wasn't about ritual. It wasn't about ritual. It was about relationship. Earlier on in that, in, in that passage, or later in that passage in Jeremiah, God describes the new covenant. He says, I will put my law in their minds and in their hearts. And Jesus made that possible. Jesus gives us the new heart. You see, the Lord's Supper is a symbolic experience. It's a sacred moment for us where we, as God's people, remember what that new heart cost us someone had to die so that you and i could have forgiveness so that you and i could have a new start so that you and i could have a new life god left heaven and he came to earth to save you and me and the cross is is one of the most beautiful pictures about a god pursuing his people so many other religions are about you get your act together and then maybe you can come to me But Jesus says, I'm coming right to where you are. I'm leaving heaven and earth, and I'm coming after you because I love you, and I want that relationship with you. I'm going to ask our our deacons if they would go ahead and come forward and and get into place. And and what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to just spend some time preparing your heart to enter in to this sacred moment. These men and, and, and other members of our staff, they're not here to serve you these elements but what they're here to do is to pray for you. Maybe there's something that you would, a need that you have in your heart and your life that you would like for them to pray with you about. They don't need to know details. All they need to know is, I need someone to pray for me, to join me in prayer. And they're here to do that. Or, or as I said earlier, those of you who, who want to give your life to Christ, one of these men can help you. Myself, our pastor, our staff, we can talk, you, talk about that. But you just prepare your hearts for this. Because again, we don't want to come to this moment lightly. We, 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 don't want to, we, we don't want to do, because we need to come with a heart of, of gratitude, a heart of humility, and a heart of reverence as we remember the price that was paid so that we can have that new heart. Jesus died so that you and I can have life.